Okay, I think we're live. Welcome, everybody. So as you can see on the screen, we have about 30 minutes to go to the call, which is the focus of today's uh, live stream. Uh, now, I have to apologize for the audio quality and the video quality. It's going to be ghetto as fuck. So just demonetize the stream right here. So I'm in a hotel basement. So the Wi-Fi here is going to be dog trash. So I don't know if you can hear me, if you can see me. I don't even know if <laughs> you guys can hear me at this point whatsoever. So before we even start this live stream, let's first make sure that you guys can even hear what I got to say. So uh, let me know in the chat if you can hear me, if you can see me, because at this point, I don't know. Um, right now I'm in France. It's 10.30 uh, p.m. over here. Uh, I've been at the pool all day. So that's uh, why I'm red and shiny. Good. So again, I'll do it as long as the conditions allow it, which means as long as we have Wi-Fi and we have audio and we have video, even if it's not quality, I'm going to do the, the live stream. So the idea of this live stream, I didn't want to jump the gun. I could have jumped on about you know 45 minutes ago and beat everybody to the punch. That's not the point of this. I want to come in cool-headed, leveled, relaxed. There's no point in panicking and like, <laughs> oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. We're not going to do this. This is unhealthy. So the idea is to come in about 30 minutes before the earnings call so we can you know, talk about it and discuss about it like in a calm manner. And uh, you know, just to kind of work through the numbers together without getting overhyped and overexcited about what's going on. So number one, um, we have uh, initial results. I'm going to pull up on the screen since we have a half hour until the actual call. So again, apologize for the video quality. I know it's bad. I know the audio quality is bad. I get it. I totally understand that's not the level of uh, of live streams I want to present usually. But, you know, I'd rather do it this way than just to miss the entire live stream altogether. So let's go through the numbers. So the numbers are out. There's no point in rushing through it. We have half an hour to do this slowly. So Q2 highlights. So first of all, gap profitability, check. Third quarter of gap profitability is in the books. And by the way, if through the stream... We have uh, uh, certain issues with audio and video. Let me know right away, okay? So gap profitability for the third consecutive quarter, as you can see, they actually wrote it down here. This was not a huge surprise. We knew this is coming. That's actually something that, you know, it wasn't really a special thing to look forward to these earnings. We knew about that. Gap income from operations, $10 million, 2% margin. Second consecutive quarter of gap operating profitability. Now, there's a huge difference between gap profitability and gap operating profitability. Again, this is a huge milestone for Palantir, not to be discounted. Adjusted EPS of five cents. Revenue grew by 13% year over year to 533 million. Now, this thing is why you see the, the share price tanking. I don't know if you guys checked it out, but the share price is tanking right now a little bit. And it's doing that because of that. So in my video yesterday, I told you that what I think is going to happen is this benchmark is going to be very meaningful for uh, how this earnings session plays out. And I'm going to make it a little bit larger on the screen so you guys can, can see exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about this specific part. So in my video yesterday, I said, look, guys, uh, what Wall Street is going to look at with Palantir is a few numbers. Uh, one of the crucial numbers with Palantir is going to be revenue growth. So again, revenue growth is 13%. Uh, it's not bad. It's not good. It's absolutely normal. The company is still growing in a very challenging macro. In my opinion, it's not a huge deal. The, the, I wouldn't even look at the share price right now because the share price is going to be absolutely insane during this time. Everything is going to be uh, basically pretty much said and done after the call. Before the call, during the call, people are going to sell. There's people are going to buy. The share price is going to go up. It's going to be down. It's going to be manic depressive as hell. This isn't the time it, it was, you know, it was red five minutes ago. Now I'm looking at it. It's up 2%. Five minutes ago, it was down 5%. So everybody needs to calm the fuck down. This isn't the time to look at the share price. The share price is going to be jumping around absolutely insane. Now, to me, personally, to me, looking at this, 13% revenue growth year over year to 533 is a little bit underwhelming because, you know, we expected them at least to maintain that 18%, 16%. 13% is a little bit underwhelming, but... Let's not, you know, uh, throw a pity party here because they still grew 13% year over year in a very challenging macro environment, high interest environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not amazing, but it's definitely, a, I would call it serviceable. 
So 13% growth year over year is serviceable. It's nothing to write home about. Uh, that's why potentially we saw the initial stock drop a little bit, but it's absolutely okay in this environment. I'll accept it. And uh, you know, that's that's fine. The main thing about this, we'll talk about in a second, will be the guidance. Uh, the guidance is gonna, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it in a second. The guidance is gonna be where it's at. Uh, because at this point, you know, uh, we already kind of knew that it's going to be a decline in the um, in, in revenue growth. But the, the main point would be to look at the guidance. So um, we'll go through it in a second. Don't worry. About it. So let's keep going through the numbers. Let's stay calm here. Um, somebody says red to green due to live stream. I, I highly doubt it, Mads. <laughs> I highly doubt it. That's the, the live stream doing that. <laughs> Um, what we, WJ King is saying in this macro, it's positive. Take it. I 100% agree. Yes, it's not amazing. It's definitely uh, uh, it's definitely okay. 13% in this macro environment, absolutely great. Yes, I know that it's not a. Uh, let's talk about it, Felix. Uh, there was an announcement about a buyback of a one billion, but that's kind of an, uh, a framework agreement in which the company says that in concept they'll do a one billion share buyback at some point. They've never said exactly when and how and how fast so this is some something to kind of uh, take in proportion yeah. they're talking about a buyback is some sort of a, a yeah. framework idea in which they want to do it i don't think it's going to be operational today or tomorrow it's just something to kind of they're trying to talk the language of wall street and that's okay i totally understand but it's not a one billion buyback today that's announced as far as if um yeah i agree with that Pantheon is still undervalued but let's keep going through the numbers here real quick uh, thank you for everybody who let me know that they can see me and hear me. Uh, okay. Again, don't worry about the short price. The share price is going to be up and down like craziness. Craziness is going to be part of this, at least until our car starts to speak in a second. Uh, okay. So uh, commercial revenue grew 10% year over year. That's nice. U.S. commercial revenue grew by 20%. That's nice. Government is pretty in, li in line with previous quarters. International government grew by 31%. That's actually pretty cool. We talked about uh, geographical risks for Palantir and how would they need to expand outside the United States. Um, yes, I am on vacation with Renato. I'm in France currently in the basement in the hotel. So uh, that's why that's that's live stream looks like that. Um, thank you for letting me know. So anyways, that's nice to see international growth going 31%. Uh, customer count, 38% growth year over year. Beautiful. U.S. commercial customer count, 35%. That's nice. Uh, cash operations of $90 million with 17% margin. That's pretty cool. Uh, cash and cash equivalents of $3.1 billion, pretty much unchanged. So uh, first half of the year highlights, uh, $1.1 billion. That's pretty much, you know, that's a TTM credit 12 month base of $2.2 billion at this point. Um, not bad for a company that, you know, barely scratched a billion just uh, yesterday, pretty much. Uh, gap income of 45 million, gap income from operations of 14 million. So everything is in positive, everything is in green. Adjusted income of 260 million. I wouldn't put too much uh, emphasis on adjusted income. Uh, cash from operations positive, adjusted free cash flow positive. So a lot of positivity on the bottom line numbers, which is pretty cool for, for a company that was criticized for being pretty much unprofitable. Uh, I want you guys to see this right here. Uh, Revenue, okay, outlook for Q3 2023. I think this is the most important part. Okay, outlook for Q3 2023. Okay, let's talk about it together. Uh, I'm not in Europe in Disney, actually, in, uh, in at, at the different region of France. I'm in Provence. Um, okay, so let's talk about it. Um, that's not far from... Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Okay, so let's let's talk about what we have with the outlook here. So as far as outlook for the stock, uh, revenue of between five five three and five five seven. That's a very generous growth quarter over quarter. Uh, full year twenty twenty three, raising revenue guidance to two point two. We said that's the trend twelve months base of two point two billion dollars, raising adjusted income to five seven six. And yes, it's going to be another gap profitability quarter. I think that's the key for Wall Street. Um, Again, uh, if you want to see the, the the bad stuff, we talked about it. Thirteen percent is pretty much thirteen percent revenue growth year over year is a decrease at the pace at which revenues are growing, which is not something we can ignore. On the other hand, uh, fourth quarter, 
we just had third quarter of gap profitability so we're going to have a fourth quarter of gap profitability based on these earnings based on this guidance which means s p inclusion is now on the table for the s p inclusion we need four consecutive quarters of gap profitability palantir just announced they're going to hit that within a quarter from now uh, which is a huge huge milestone for the company um, i think that's pretty cool again everybody's excited about the yes Provence sneeze that that is actually correct but, uh, one billion dollar buyback i think that's also pretty you know if if you kind of want to talk about you know uh, if you want to talk the language of wall street you have to talk about the things they care about um and talking about buybacks and talking about gap profitability for four consecutive quarters that's something that investors in wall street want to hear especially institutional investors now um i want i want to take a look at the presentation just before the call we still have 20 minutes for the to the call and that's the perfect time to go through the presentation we all we need about 20 minutes to run through it uh, we'll do it together and then we'll jump on the call and we, we hear what palantir has to say uh, okay i'm going to pull it up on the screen right now let's see if we got it uh, and by the way shout out to everybody showing up here to this uh, unannounced stream i know i didn't promote the stream i didn't talk about it it was kind of a last minute thank you all for showing up here if you're here you are a true og on the channel and i appreciate you you know coming to the basement with me um okay so that's a good comment considering that right now we're in proposal season <laughs> um okay so uh rich says audio and visuals are good tom thank you rich rich is one of my moderators on the channel one of my uh, founding members appreciate it okay so let's talk about the numbers here uh shout out to uh b naga i'm 100 up on margin my account full port policy cost base of 7.21 let's go uh, no no you guys you guys at the community listen before we go through the presentation i just want to make sure we understand each other here let's talk about it uh, it's not about me it's about you guys. You guys are the community. You guys make it happen. Without you guys, it's meaningless. Everybody, it's every single person that's here in the chat, everybody that's on the Discord, everybody's watching the videos, every single one of you is what it's all about. It's not about Tom. I'm just the kind of the mediator. I'm the moderator. You guys are what it's all about. And I'm here to serve you. And I, I don't take this for granted. 2,200 people showing up here in the middle of the night, unannounced. I didn't post about it. I didn't say anything. You just come in here, uh, bad audio, bad video. You're still here, you know, rocking with me. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the numbers here. Okay. Okay. So let's go through the highlights. Third conservative quarter of gap profitability. Let's go. Beautiful. By the way, uh, let me know if you guys, I can probably make it a little bit bigger. So, yeah, I think it's better. Um, no, no, you guys are. You guys are. I truly do appreciate it um hey christoph i appreciate you guys uh, i appreciate every single one of you here thank you so much it, it means a lot anyways so uh thank you second quarter of gap profitability uh second second quarter of gap of, yeah we saw that that's the highlights uh i think we saw all of that already apologize for the noise from my end let's keep scrolling okay so 1.1 billion revenue that's on pace for 2.2 billion for the year uh, Mm -hmm. that's the aap con stuff we talked about already let's go to the financials i'm i mean i'm not disrespecting the presentation here at all but i would like to see more of the numbers yeah that's that's numbers let's go to numbers okay financials sorry i'm i'm more focused on the financials i know some of you want to see the presentation it's available but i just want to watch the the numbers uh, because we don't have a lot of times we have about 15 minutes before the presentation and i want to make sure uh, the live presentation that is we go through the numbers. Okay. So gap profitability, third quarter. We saw that operating income. Okay. So this is interesting. U.S. commercial revenue growth. Let's talk about it a little bit here. That's the important part. So 20% growth on U.S. commercial, 10% on U.S. government revenue growth. So we're talking about a, a very interesting trajectory for the company. Government revenue growth of 15%, commercial of 10%. That's that's the mixture that gave you that 13%, I think. Um, there is definitely a, something to be said about, a, you know, Palantir had an original guidance of 30%, and people kind of still have that in the, in the mirror. But, I mean, the world has changed, the macro has changed. I mean, double-digit growth in this environment is actually very impressive. Um, total revenue growth of 
average TTM revenue per top 20 customers. Now, this is the part I want to talk to you about. Really, like this second part of the slide, I think doesn't get enough coverage in all the channels that kind of cover Palantir. And I want to talk about it real quick. Um, this is super, super important. Um, you see, this is the where the rubber meets the road for this company. And unfortunately, it doesn't get enough coverage. So the top 20 customers of Palantir are driving, uh, if you do the math, uh, almost half their business. We're talking about uh, 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 almost a, a billion dollars from the top 20 clients. So if your top 20 clients are responsible for half your revenues and you manage to grow these every single quarter, and again, that number, if I pull this back and I, wide, and I widen the zoom out for this thing, we're going to see that every single quarter, their average TTM revenue per top 20 customer goes up and up and up in double digits. So we're talking about, look, there's 20 major companies and institutions that spend over $50 million in every single freaking year just on Palantir products. 50 million per year, it's not something you pay for, you know, stuff that doesn't work. Let's, let's be honest, okay? That's huge. Uh, but it also has kind of a problem to it because when, unfortunately, when, you know, 20 of your customers are in charge of 50% of your revenue, that's client concentration. That's something that Wall Street always sees as a risk. Shout out to Dom here. Hey, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, and that's actually a very good comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. What he's saying, two ways to look at it is exactly what Dom is saying. On the one hand, it's beautiful. On the other hand, there's definitely, it, it is a double-edged sword. It's a beautiful comment, Dom. Shout out to you, by the way. Uh, it's a beautiful comment because the double-edged sword is that you have a very high client concentration. Assuming something happens to, you know, two of these 20 clients, we're talking about $100 million in revenue gone. So there's a high concentration of, of, of top 20 clients, which, you know, they have to work on. And we've talked about it, so let's not, you know, beat around the bush about this. We, we, we know about this. Uh, gross margins stay steady above 80 percent as any you know dom can tell you dom works in SaaS. and um, he can tell you uh, in any uh, SaaS company ser ser services software company 80 percent gross margin is standard it's normal it's nothing to get excited about palantir 80 percent is what you get in every SaaS company because that's the, you know the structure of cost in the services software business and um, q2 2023 adjusted operating income was 135 million dollars Margin of 25%. Again, when I see adjusted, I mean, I'm not excited about anything that says adjusted in the, you know, in the title. Uh, now, this is a very interesting uh, uh, table here because, uh, again, we have a little bit of time. I'm always keeping, we have about 12 minutes before the live stream. Look at the customer count of this company. I mean, uh, and look at the billings, okay? This is Q2 of last year. This is Q2 of this year. So within the span of a year, this company went from being under 400 million in billings to over 600 million in billings. So 200 million more in billings, 52% increase in a single year. Look at the customer count. This was June, 2022. We're currently in June, 2023 from 300 clients to 421 clients. So absolutely insane. So again, I know the numbers are not huge. It's not snowflake guys. We're not talking about a product that's you know low um, kind of a low tier product where you just you sell mass, they sell a high end, you know, a high ticket item. On a high ticket item, you're naturally going to have less customer count. You know, you have 421,000 clients. But look at the percentages. Show me a company that has 40% year over year growth in customer count. What they're doing here, it's very obvious to me. What they're doing here is they're creating a basis. So they're creating a basis in which they're bringing the customers. They're not going full tilt, squeezing the lemon all the way through. They're just trying to get through the door, get through the door. We'll build stuff for you. Then you buy more. And I want to see the net door retention. I hope they talk about the net door retention for this. But just look at the amount of deals they sign every single quarter. 66 deals of 1 million, 30 of 5 million, 18 deals of 10 million. Every quarter they have these numbers and people take it for granted with Palantir, even though they shouldn't. I mean, that's not a taking for granted number. Any other company, you would be super excited about this. But because Palantir does it every single time, it's like watching Michael Jordan play. Whenever he does something spectacular, people can kind of get used to it. Um, the, the cash position is pretty much standard, $3 billion in cash, no debt. We know this about Palantir, beautiful balance sheet. Um, this is actually a phenomenal number. If they do $550 million in Q3, that's going to be insane. That's actually a very good guidance. For the full year, if they do 2.2, it's also going to be very good numbers. Guidance is good. Guidance is good. Um, I'm curious to see the net dollar retention here. And it's uh, something that I can't find here. 
and it's a shame because that would be really interesting for me to see. If anybody has seen the net or intention, that's something I, I would be curious in checking out. Um, let's let's go back. We have ten more minutes for the for the stream. Let's take a look at something here real quick. I want to show you guys. Hold on. Uh, letter from Alex Carr. Let's talk about this letter real quick. Um, okay. Let's pull it up on the screen, and then we will go to the live stream in a second. Um, before I go through the letter, you know what? I want to take a few comments because you guys are here in the chat. Uh, you guys are commenting, so I want to make sure I give you guys your props. Uh, one second. Um, okay, before we do that, hold on. Okay, I found it. Okay, let me pull it up on the screen. Apologies, I'm doing this on a... On the computer screen with no no equipment, so I'm I'm doing my best. People said stop apologizing, but I can't. I'm used to a higher like production value than this. <laughs> okay, so before we go through the letter, I want to give a few shout outs here. I want to give a shout out to Rich, one of my moderators. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Gabe, who's here, one of my moderators. Thank you so much. And I want to give a shout out to every single one here. Uh, and yeah. Net, net revenue retention is where I want to also look at Dom. It's super interesting to me because it was 119% a year ago, then it dropped to 111. I want to see that at least they kind of maintain that. 110. Okay. That's pretty much on par. What, thank you for, uh, Michael, thank you for letting me know because, you know, I'm working with the stream here so I can search for every single one. 110 percent uh, retention is pretty much what they had last quarter. They had 111%. 110 percent is within, you know, uh, standard deviation. So that's absolutely normal. Wow. Very, very good. Uh, so this is something I want to talk about here for what Dave is saying. So Dave is saying, I hope we tank more so we can buy more. So look, I want to explain something here with Palantir. And it's super, super important that you guys listen up. Uh, I'm going to pull up. Hold on. Sorry about that. But I want to pull up the share price here. Listen, this is probably going to be the most important part of the stream. Uh, I'm not expecting anything like uh, uh, every single person to listen. But those of you who, who will listen will benefit from this. Look at the share price right here, okay? I want to explain something real simple. So look at the share price. So this is the share price just after the numbers came out, right? Immediately, I told you. I told you this is going to happen. Price was at $18. It dropped all the way down to $16.7. Dropped 5%, 4%, whatever. It spiked back up. Now it's up 2.4% after hours. Again, and if we even do that, let's go five year. Let's go one year. Let's go year to date. So as you can see, like, I want to talk about this super important stuff. If it tanks, when you say a lot more, I don't, I don't want you to get overexcited, Dave. I don't, the one thing I don't want people to do, and I appreciate it, and I, you know, I sound like a broken record. I don't want you to go all in, balls deep into a stock because of dips. Buying the dip has to be methodical it has to be careful and it has to be very very slow so when you say i hope it tanks so i can buy more i hope what you're talking about dave is dollar cost averaging a little bit faster so instead of buying a little bit you're buying a little bit more but i definitely don't i i don't feel comfortable you know going lump sum and buying massive amounts of stock just because it dipped in a certain day so when i have the system and i talked about it many many times i buy a certain amount every single month if it dips then i buy a little bit more and how much it dips how much more i buy i talked about it i don't want to repeat myself but definitely don't go lump sum you know balls deep into a stock just because it dipped in a single day that's not the right way to do it so just be careful if it, you know if it drops a little bit, you can increase the pace of your dollar cost average but at the end of the day you're not going to get it done by buying it in a single day just you know it's a very very important message um Okay. Um, again, once upon a reset, I really want to talk about this and I want to be very, very clear with this. This is a very nice headline saying it's the messy of AI. It's a very nice headline, but it's not going to happen in a single day. It cannot go up 30% in a single day and for it to be okay. If the stock goes up 30% in a single day, it's not healthy for the stock. It's not healthy for you as an investor. It's it's gambling. It's nothing more but gambling. It's it's not. I, I don't expect it to go up 30%. If it does, it's absolute insanity silliness. So again, if it is the messy of AI, it's going to have a very long trajectory in which it's going to deliver great results over the next five years. I mean, 
you should as a long-term investor you shouldn't think in 30 percent in a day kind of terms that's kind of an options short-term play um, and what dom is saying is what i want you guys to focus i hope we have a lot of customers in the acquisition expand phase which means great things from a year from now he's talking about how to build the foundations and tr trust me listen to dom dom actually works in this industry he knows this industry he works in SaaS in one of the biggest companies you you know about he's talking from experience from a pro level experience you build a foundation you create customer acquisition you deliver revenues in the next quarter in the next year this is how it's don't look at the percentages in the stock look at the quality of the business guys we have you know it's nice to look at the stock but the more important part here is look at the business as shareholders in Palantir, you're not buying a piece of paper. You're buying a piece of the business, a, a, a percentage of a business. So uh, getting over ex over excited about a share price and over focused about a share price instead of the business, I think it's a colossal mistake for shareholders. Don't do it. Trust me. Listen to what Dom has to say. That's the way to do it. Um, mm, Taimon says, I think the key again is confirm positive net result. Potential inclusion SP 500, that's correct, which is closer and closer, which is also mentioned in the guidance of 2023 as well. 100% agree. Yes. Agree. Very good comment by Taman. Mm. Pot spread, thank you so much. I appreciate it, brother. Um, what do I think about this earnings? I think it's not bad. I think it's good i think it, palantir continuing to grow continuing to deliver double digit results learning to speak the language of wall street talking about buybacks talking about better guidance talk about uh, uh, stuff that they care about i mean that's the way to do it it i mean you cannot just you know about a year ago when they started doing that everything changed everything clicked i think alex harp you know realized he has to speak the language of wall street uh, no again buybacks uh, Again, we're talking about the billion over probably, you know, it's not going to happen in a single day. They're talking about a very long period of time. It's more of them talking the Wall Street language. Uh, it's going to probably, you know, if it's, you know, uh, over 10 years, that's reasonable. Um, uh, Dom is saying the 110%, we have three minutes for the live call. Three minutes for the live call. The 110% uh, tells me uh, we are definitely more in the acquisition and expand phase and not massive revenue and margin growth until we hit scale phases. So I want to break down this comment because I don't think you guys realize how much value is in this comment. Again, dominating your investments, it's Dom's channel. Dom Rinaldi, go subscribe to his channel. So Dom works in software as a service business. He works in one of the largest companies. You all heard about, I don't want to name drop here. He he works intimately in this industry. So he's not, he, and he understands sales perfectly. What Dom is telling you is like, look guys, if we are currently at 110% retention, net dollar retention, that means, and look at Snowflake. Snowflake is at 180%. Snowflake is in a different phase than Palantir. Palantir has also a different strategy than Snowflake. So, you know, Palantir is selling a high ticket item. The idea is to bring the customer in, whatever cost, even at cost basis, you know, just don't even make money on the customers. Bring your customer in through the door, make sure you lock them in for cheap, you know, loss leader, uh, it, they, you know, a loss leader strategy, even if you need so. Once you get the customer in, you start expanding your offering and selling them more and more upscaling, upselling, et cetera, et cetera. But for the first stage, you have to acquire the customers, even if the cost is not being super profitable. That's what Dom was saying. And that means that a year, two, three from now, you're going to reap the rewards of the strategy. And I completely agree with that. That's a, that's a very important comment. Um, um, Sakib, Sakib saying, as long as you are here making content cross notification, that's what matters. I really appreciate that comment. Really does. It means a lot to me. Uh, we have about a minute to go for the live stream. Good day to Steve. Uh, Momo is saying Tom is on his vacation in France, away from his family, doing this. Hit the damn like button, please. Only 300. That's the least we can. No, no, don't forget about the like button. I don't care about these things. I honestly don't care about the like button. I honestly do. Don't spend, don't waste your time on the like button. Uh, trust me, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, Look, this is another, we have one minute left of the live stream. I want to talk about this comment. Should have bought more at six. Should have bought more at seven. Should have bought more at eight. Nonsense. It's bullshit. Fuck that. Listen to me. It doesn't matter when your entry point is. As long as you identify it's a good company and you start dollar cost averaging right now, even at $18, and your dollar cost average slowly over the course of the next three to five years, and you buy a little bit every time, and you buy a little bit more when it dips, it goes below a certain threshold. 
like let's say 10% below the 52 week high, then you will get a low cost basis in this company without trying to time the market. Nobody could have known that six or seven was the bottom. Maybe five was the bottom. Maybe eight was the bottom. So stop that. Let's go to the live stream. I'm going to pull it up on the screen right now. Okay. There's no audio yet from the live stream as far as I can hear it. Um, uh, so I'm going to pull up a few more comments. Thomas covered this amazing strategy on this channel, and I personally have adopted this. Yes, this you know that's the way to do it. That's how that, you know they talked about this. They said, "Look, we don't care about margins, we don't care about a, a revenue growth. All we care about is creating a monopoly, and in that monopoly, uh, we're going to dominate so much that by the time that these guys uh, actually are in inside the system, they don't have a choice." Uh, leaving Palantir as an existing client, they have a very sticky product as it is. So, you know, uh, go read zero to one. Uh, zero to one, uh, actually, you know, Peter Thiel talks about it. Uh, zero to one, he talked about it. I'm going to create a, a, a company that... Good afternoon. Well, I'm Ana Saro from Palantir's finance team, and I'd like to welcome you to our second quarter 2023 earnings call. Uh, can everybody hear the audio from the, the YouTube channel? In our press release issued after the market close and posted on Let our Let me know if you can hear the audio website. so I can mute myself. During the call, we will make statements regarding our business that may be considered forward-looking within applicable securities laws, including statements regarding our third quarter and fiscal 2023 results, management's expectations for our future financial and operational performance, and other statements regarding our plans, prospects, and expectations. These statements are not promises or guarantees and are subject to risks and uncertainties which could cause them to differ materially from actual results. Information concerning those risks is available in our earnings press release distributed after the market closed today and in our SEC filings. We undertake no obligation to update forward-looking statements except as required by law. Further, during the course of today's call, we will refer to certain adjusted financial measures. These non-GAAP financial measures should be considered in addition to, not as a substitute for, or in isolation from, GAAP measures. Additional information about these non-GAAP measures, including reconciliation of non-GAAP to comparable GAAP measures, is included in our press release and investor presentation provided today. Our press release, investor presentation, and SEC filings are available on our investor relations website at investors.palantir.com. Over the course of the call, we will refer to various growth rates when discussing our business. These rates reflect year-over-year -year comparisons, unless otherwise stated. Joining me on today's call are Alex Karp, Chief Executive Officer, Sham Sankar, Chief Technology Officer, Dave Glazer, Chief Financial Officer, and Ryan Taylor, Chief Revenue Officer and Chief Legal Officer. I'll now turn it over to Alex for opening remarks. Welcome to our earnings. Um, we are at a unique uh, period at Palantir. Through the course of the last 20 years, we built what is an arguably one of the most interesting, impactful, product offerings in the world, PGA, Foundry, our target selection platform, Apollo. Uh, our goal at Palantir was to be the most impactful, important software company in the world, a company transforming Western institutions. Um, and the, the, the underlying goal there was um, to make the West stronger and to make Palantir the most important software company in the world. In a weird way, in the last the last couple months since we launched uh, AIP, since we had AIPCon, uh, we have seen the way in which technologies we've built that seem to be of moderate utility were built almost in anticipation of the AI revolution, both algorithmic and large language models. And that convergence has remade Palantir taking Palantir away from its terminal value being it made the world better by making our institutions in the West stronger, more productive, more efficient, in some cases more deadly, uh, to giving us the aspiration and realistic perspective of being the most valuable uh, enterprise software company in the world. Um, we see a market, especially in the US, which is hungry for an ability to apply AI, both large language models and 
algorithms to transform our businesses. I believe this transformation will change the GDP of America and that Palantir will participate in that in the delta between where the GDP is now and where it will get to, powered by unique technologies that uh, are almost exclusively being built in the United States and are being adopted more rapidly, more efficiently, with more vigor. Of course, there are headwinds. Many of the people uh, and companies who have no product to offer and are, do not have the technical capabilities to build them are trying to slow down this revolution for the obvious reason that they, they're not participating in it. And, and these tools are accelerating uh, innovation so that if you're not participating, you're literally standing still while everyone is accelerating and they're no longer and they're no longer luxury products in the way people thought having world-class software was. So buying Foundry appeared to many institutions as, well, of course it's the best product, but it's a, it would require us to change how we function or change how we procure software. By the way, the large language model revolution has changed Palantir's relationships to institutions because we were misaligned for years and years with IT all globally. We were misaligned with the way in which we thought an enterprise should be run. But the way in which you actually can process large language models to get more exact, more precise, to get more exact, more precise, more operationally valuable insights, the way you can actually write them safely into your enterprise, meaning you can test large language models to get more exact, more precise, more operationally valuable insights, the way you can actually write them safely into your enterprise, meaning you can control your enterprise, the way you can turn them into logic that allows you to power your enterprise both in a read-write function with uh, governance that is mandated by law or by ethics, uh, we provide. Um, those ways of working are exactly the ways we always thought one would have to work, but before the delta was insufficient and and then last, not least, there's no roadmap. Palantir is the world's best at no roadmap innovation products built for a world where things disintegrate and you actually need to do things in the way they would be done in the natural state. So in the natural state, you would have something like Foundry, you would have an ontology, you would have AIP. Institutions in America are going back to their natural state, a state for which we've built products, uh, especially in the US. We, we, you see this in Palantir's numbers. So why is that? Because we've built products for the natural state of how an enterprise should work. That state is apparent to people because of the, the enormous power, the power to accelerate, accelerate time, change your business using large language models. And therefore, it is something which people embrace. We've now moved from being, and that product, our product, our culture fits both a efficiently and in a way that's prismatic uh, to especially U.S. commercial institutions and also uh, of the competent. And it puts us in a remade transfer, transformed position where we can, the, the aspiration of powering uh, our most important institutions, which is clearly nowhere nowhere near done, so intelligence and defense, uh, has gotten us to the point where I think it's indisputable that Palantir's uh, software uh, in that space is the, is the most important in the world. Now, in, 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 while continuing to focus on that, we can focus on, okay, but given that we've built these precursor technologies, given that our product has moved from being nascent to having thousands of users, uh, the AIP product, given that we believe that the reception to this is unlike anything we've seen in PG, Foundry, Apollo, uh, target selection, and given the receptivity of the market, also not to mention that we have been profitable now, we, we expect to be eligible for the S&P uh, for several quarters we've been profitable, that we have over $3 billion in the bank. That positions us to fulfill our new our new uh, aspiration 
allows us to see in the future how we would do that, which is to simply be the most valuable enterprise software company in the world. Uh, and we are uh, joyous for this moment. Uh, and thank you for being uh, with us today. For the third consecutive quarter, our company achieved gap profitability and again maintained a gap operating income in Q2. This is a testament to our steadfast focus and commitment to delivering results and impact for our partners, all while innovating against the AI opportunities ahead. Last quarter, we hosted AIPCon, which convened over 150 unique organizations as we formally launched our new AIP product offering and customers demonstrated how we're partnering with them to unlock the value of AI. For example, Jacob's engineering enabling them to monitor current system conditions and conduct future infrastructure planning in real time versus the months of analysis it would have taken previously. Similarly, JD Power's chief digital and technology officer asserted that the advantage comes not from the AI models you can build, but rather how you apply them to the data you have and deploy it into applications. This is where true value is created for our customers and where we stand poised to help. The CEO of Novartis was recently interviewed on CNBC discussing our partnership in which we created an integrated data lake that they are now leveraging to move AI forward quickly within the company, which the CEO calls Novartis's quote, fundamental advantage over its peers. We launched AIP just 10 weeks ago, and already we're seeing unprecedented inbound interest. AIP is also opening expansion conversations with our largest, longest tenured customers, as the new capabilities are causing them to reimagine how they can use our software. Looking at both existing and new customers, AIP is the solution for organizations who want to wield LLMs securely in their enterprise. We remain focused on, on aggressively capitalizing on this momentum by driving and compounding growth of AIP usage. As this fast moving market evolves and expands, so too will we. And it's just the beginning. This increasing demand for commercial business continues to deliver outsized results. With our rapidly growing customer events like AIPCon through direct customer referrals to their network, or by leaders working with us in one organization, taking us with them to their next one, we expect the expansion effect to be multiplicative. At the same time, we're seeing success across many different industries. In Q2, we closed deals in US commercial in roughly 30 different industries, including across pharmaceuticals, energy, consumer staples, utilities, healthcare, construction, automotive, transportation infrastructure, the list goes on and spans industries and institutions at the core of today's society. While we see the breadth of our software spanning industries, we still have immense opportunity for growth, both through expansion within these industries and growth in our existing customer relationships. For example, we're beginning to see this growth come to fruition in both healthcare and transportation, which grew 93% and 129% year over year, respectively. Foundry is being used at numerous healthcare facilities to generate nurse schedules and forecast patient placements, among other applications. For example, with Foundry, HCA now generates nurse schedules in one hour each month instead of 10 to 20. Tampa General has seen a 28% reduction in patient hold times and has reduced the time spent managing patient placements by 83%. And Cleveland Clinic has been able to accept an 8.5% increase in patient transfers from other hospitals in just four months since launch. While we continue to increase our breadth and expansion across industries, we also continue to grow at our existing customers. We had over two dozen U.S. commercial customers that brought in more than one million in revenue each during last quarter alone. And we're seeing outsized growth from our newest customers. 54% of the U.S. commercial revenue, excluding strategic commercial contracts, is from customers that have started since the beginning of 2021 with nearly all of the year-over-year -year growth coming from those same customers. We expect this trend to continue. We are investing in pockets of momentum within our international commercial business, such as Japan, Korea, Canada, and the Middle East, among other targeted opportunities across the world. For example, through our go-to-market partnership, Fujitsu has seen recent success onboarding eight new large-cap household name Japanese customers. At the same time, we are seeing AIP lead to expansion conversations with our largest long-standing customers in Europe, all against the challenging backdrop of today's climate. 
On the international government side, our UK government business was particularly strong in Q2 as a result of our work with organizations such as the NHS and UK Ministry of Defense, including the Royal Navy. Within our US government business, while the revenue results in Q2 are disappointing, they belie the long-term strength of our business. We remain focused on converting significant deals in the pipeline and growing existing contracts through which we are core to the government mission. In Q2, we secured a multi-year contract award from the U.S. Special Operations Command worth up to $463 million, new contract awards for the Air and Space Forces of $110 million, and conversion of Army Research Lab R&D funding to longer-term work with COCOMs, starting with CENTCOM. We believe in the criticality and meaningful impact our work is having in today's world events and its eventual monetization, as well as the exceptional user impact we deliver. At the same time, our U.S. government business can be lumpy, and we continue to expect there to be near-term uncertainty around timing of contract awards. Turning back to the overall business, we are excited about our vast opportunities in the quarters ahead. We're already seeing that AIP will be transformational for our customers and for our business. We look forward to continuing innovating at the forefront through this revolution. Lastly, on the back of our inaugural AIP Con in Q2, we're excited to share that we're hosting two additional events, the next AIP Con on September 14th, and a new event, the Software for Government S4G Summit on September 21st, which is specifically designed for our government customers. We look forward to sharing a recap of the events with you at future calls. I'll now turn it over to Sham. Thanks, Ryan. At AIPCon this past June, we introduced Palantir's AI platform, a core set of technologies designed to bring LLMs to your enterprise to supercharge and accelerate your experiences. From integrating data and hydrating your ontology to building AI-enabled applications and human agent teams with co-pilots. AIP enables you to deploy LLMs anchored in your data on your private network and to safely orchestrate your enterprise with tools, actions, and other AI models. All of this in a controlled, governed, and trusted AI operating system. The accelerating pace of AI developments continues to be awe-inspiring. The key to capturing value is a fundamental recognition that we are dealing with something new and different that demands solving new integration and engineering challenges. It is in many ways easier to define an LLM by what it is not. It is not algorithmic reasoning. It is not human thought. Algorithmic reasoning operates as a process so well specified that there's no ambiguity in its execution, like traditional code. Human thought is inherently creative and its previously most defining form, natural language, is inextricably wrought with ambiguity. Large language models occupy a middle ground between algorithmic reasoning and human thought. They are fluent in natural language, yet they don't really understand what they say. They are not good at executing algorithms, yet they can be instructed in ordinary prose. They are something else, non-algorithmic compute. LLMs are statistics, not calculus, and the introduction of even one stochastic variable into a deterministic system makes the entire system now stochastic. At AIPCon 2 in September, I'm going to unpack some of the foundational engineering challenges that we've solved to manage and harness the stochasticity of these models and to enable the acceleration in our products. We are focused on driving compounding usage. Across industries, the problems that matter haven't changed. AIP and LLMs radically accelerate the solutions. We are building on nearly 20 years of our products and experience solving these problems across more than 50 industries and every function in the value chain, only now doing it substantially faster. To name a few, a nurse shift handoff copilot for HCA, a pharmacokinetics translation assistant for Novartis, an inventory balancer copilot for a plant-based protein company, a supply chain copilot for a major beverage company. Our warranty claims co-pilot for a U.S. auto manufacturer has made analysts twice as productive, saving them three to four hours a day. As J.D. Power's CTO Bernardo said at AIPCon, the beauty of having Foundry and AIP is that you can build this really, really quickly. So we built this in a matter of days and iterated in a couple of weeks. To get the precision of calculus and the power of statistics, LLMs need to be paired with algorithmic and software tools. For example, models of forward inventory or an action registry to execute enterprise functions, a rich semantic layer to define the proper grounding, and crucial primitives like scenarios that allow LLMs to stage changes on branches. 
AIP is not only the best tool bench in this context, it is a tool factory that enables enterprises to quickly forge new bespoke tools in hours. LLMs can't, for example, calculate profitability or expected lead times, but they don't have to. They need to have access to the software tools that can. This is why AIP is positioned to deliver outcomes so quickly. It elegantly integrates LLMs into the calculus of your enterprise to accelerate the workflows that matter. Every week, we are releasing more features and expanding the AIP productivity suite of applications, which provide WYSIWYG, what you say is what you get experiences. AIP Builder allows you to build your data pipelines with natural semantics. AIP Terminal is the command line for your AI operating system, enabling you to dynamically wield your ontology tools and applications for ad hoc exploration and problem solving. AIP Logic enables you to build LLM-backed functions with rich tool composition in its developer tool chain. And AIP Automate lets you turn those logic functions into agents, co-pilots, and automations. One more item in the suite I want to highlight. AIP Assist, which accelerates all of today's uses and users of AIP, Gotham, and Foundry by providing help and helpers dynamically. AIP Assist is configured to be tool aware, so it knows not only everything from the product documentation, it also knows what actions it can take to manipulate the application state to actually resolve and advance the user's workflow. This supercharges our users. And as a technology, it should be available for any software to incorporate to supercharge their users. In the second half of this year, we anticipate accepting beta customers who want to use AIP Assist as a service offering in their own software. Turning to Gotham, the latest investments in Gotham performed excellently at CENTCOM's Digital Falcon Oasis and other exercise across combatant commands, including Global Information Dominance Experiment Series 6. We continue to invest in capabilities delivering the next level of deterrence through the AI-enabled kill chain, inclusive of an integrated coalition deterrent. There's a lot more to say here, but I'd rather hide our strength and bide our time against the adversaries. We continue to be very excited about Apollo. It continues to be a massive lever for Palantir internally, as well as a big market opportunity. Over the last few years, Apollo has allowed us to scale up internally from managing 15 high side stacks to 82 without scaling our team. In the market, as more defense startups are born with a surge of VC investment in the space, we believe Apollo stands as the fastest and cheapest path to delivering new capabilities to regulated and accredited environments. And in Q2, we started seeing demand from the government itself as a customer. USG customers want to move existing services they manage into FedStar to reduce their own operating risk and compliance burden. In closing, we just wrapped up our annual hack week. Right after this call, I'll be binge watching all the submissions from the teams internally. I'm very much looking forward to further acceleration of our roadmaps from compelling new ideas. I'll turn it over to Dave to walk through the financials. Thanks, Sean. The second quarter of 2023 was exceptionally strong. We're proud to report our third consecutive quarter of GAP profitability and second consecutive quarter of GAP operating profitability, generating 28 million of net income and 10 million of operating income. This also marked the third consecutive quarter of expanding adjusted operating margins, highlighting the operating leverage in our business. We surpassed the high end of our guidance for both revenue and adjusted income from operations yet again. We also achieved a significant revenue milestone, surpassing 2 billion in revenue on a trailing 12 month basis for the first time. We remain committed to driving profitable growth and we reaffirm our expectation of gap profitability in each quarter of this year which would make us eligible for inclusion in the S&P 500 following our Q3 results. Turning to our global top line results, we generated 533 million in revenue of 13% year over year and 2% sequentially, exceeding the high end of the range of our prior guidance. Excluding the impact of revenue from strategic commercial contracts, total revenue grew 16% year over year and 5% sequentially. Revenue from our largest customers continues to expand. Trailing 12-month revenue per customer from our top 20 customers increased 15% year-over-year to $53 million per customer. Customer account grew 38% year-over-year and 8% sequentially to 421 customers, demonstrating the momentum in our ability to onboard and convert new customers. Now moving to our commercial segment. Second quarter commercial revenue grew 10% year-over-year and declined 2% sequentially to $232 million, a challenging sequential compare, as anticipated, to the 14 million decline in revenue from strategic commercial contracts. Excluding the impact from strategic commercial contracts, commercial revenue grew 19% year over year and 5% sequentially. 
U.S. commercial revenue in the second quarter grew 20% year-over-year and declined 4% sequentially to $103 million. Excluding revenue from strategic commercial contracts, U.S. commercial revenue grew 37% year-over-year and 7% sequentially, a result that is even more impressive when compounded with the 24% sequential growth we saw last quarter. Our U.S. commercial customer count grew 35% year-over-year and 4% sequentially, marking the 10th consecutive quarter of sequential growth. This highlights the velocity we are seeing in our U.S. commercial business, where we're driving significant new customer wins and expansions. Our international commercial business grew 4% year-over-year to $129 million and remained flat sequentially. Relative to the U.S., we continue to see more muted growth with European commercial enterprises, although there remain targeted opportunities of growth internationally. Revenue from strategic commercial contracts was $19 million compared to $33 million in the prior quarter. We expect third quarter revenue to decline to between 14 to 16 million, and we anticipate fourth quarter revenue from these customers to continue to trend down. For the full year, we expect revenue from these customers to be approximately 3% of total full year revenue. Turning to our government segment, government revenue grew 15% year over year and 4% sequentially to 302 million. U.S. government revenue grew 10% year over year and declined 2% sequentially to 225 million. While we acknowledge that there are uncertainties associated with the timing of contract expansions and renewals, we maintain a strong pipeline of opportunities and remain confident in the growth of our U.S. government business, particularly as USG TCV bookings grew 111% sequentially. International government revenue grew 31% year-over-year and 29% sequentially to $76 million. The reacceleration in our international government business was driven by our U.K. government work. While government business generally sees fluctuations due to the nature of funding and contract cycles, we remain confident that our work with the UK government will continue to expand over the long term. Turning to bookings, TCV booked was $642 million, up 62% sequentially. Billings was $603 million, up 52% year over year. We ended the second quarter with $3.4 billion in total remaining deal value and $968 million in remaining performance obligations. As a reminder, RPO is primarily comprised of our commercial business as it does not take into account contracts with an initial term of less than 12 months and contractual obligations that fall beyond termination for convenience clauses, both of which are common in most of our government business. Turning to margin and expense, adjusted gross margin, which excludes stock-based compensation expense, was 81% for the quarter. Adjusted income for operations, which excludes stock-based compensation expense and related employer payroll taxes, was $135 million representing an adjusted operating margin of 25%, 200 basis points ahead of the high end of our prior guidance, and marking a third consecutive quarter of expanding adjusted operating margins. These results demonstrate our ability to drive revenue growth while efficiently managing costs, with second quarter adjusted expense of 398 million, up only 9% year over year and down sequentially. We continue to manage expense growth primarily by driving leverage in GNA, capitalizing on cloud efficiencies, and calibrating our headcount investments in key strategic areas of growth. Consistent with prior years, we expect to see an increase in expenses in the third quarter as we onboard our new grad cohort of world-class technical talent. As we have stated over the past few quarters, we are fiercely committed to sustained GAAP profitability. On the back of three consecutive quarters of GAAP net income and expanding operating margins, we are increasing investments and resources dedicated to our new product, AIP, while at the same time increasing our full-year adjusted income from operations guidance to an excess of $576 million, an increase of $45 million above the midpoint of our prior range. Looking ahead to the second half of the year, we remain focused on calibrating expense growth below revenue growth, even as we increase investment and resourcing to AIP and invest in specific geographies around the world. We generated income from operations of $10 million, our second consecutive quarter of GAAP operating income. We continue to manage our stock-based compensation. As mentioned last quarter, we expect it to trend up through the back half of the year. However, we remain laser-focused on gap net income and operating profitability. As we think about equity compensation and aligning it to shareholder value, we are in the process of linking future employee equity compensation to the success of AIP. Turning to net income, gap net income was $28 million, our third consecutive quarter of gap profitability. Adjusted earnings per share was five cents and gap earnings per share was one cent. Additionally, our combined revenue growth and adjusted operating margin was 38%. We expect to return to executing in excess of the rule of 40 for the second half of the year. Turning to our cash flow, 
We generated 96 million in adjusted free cash flow, representing a margin of 18%, and 90 million in cash from operations, representing a margin of 17%. Through the first half of the year, we generated 285 million in adjusted free cash flow, representing a margin of 27%. We ended the second quarter with 3.1 billion in cash, cash equivalents, and short term US Treasury bills. We retain access to additional liquidity of up to 500 million through our revolving credit facility, which remains entirely undrawn. Now, turning to our outlook. For Q3 2023, we expect revenue of between 553 and 557 million, adjusted income from operations of between 135 and 139 million, and gap net income. For full year 2023, we are raising our revenue guidance to an excess of 2.212 billion. We are raising our adjusted income from operations guidance to an excess of 576 million and we continue to expect gap net income in each quarter. On the back of our third consecutive quarter of gap profitability, 285 million in adjusted free cash flow in the first half of the year and over 3.1 billion on our balance sheet, our board of directors has authorized a stock repurchase program of up to 1 billion. This program reflects our conviction in the trajectory of our business and the value we see in our stock. With that, I'll turn it over to Anna to start the Q&A. Thanks, Dave. We'll begin with a few questions from our shareholders before we open up the call. Our first question is from Gaurav, who asks, what are some of the AI advantages Palantir has that none of the other companies can compete with? Uh, I'll take that one. The, uh, Palantir is optimally positioned for AI because the value is going to increase to the incumbents. Uh, it's going to accrete to the people who own the workflow, who own the software. So in our case, it's not just the customers that we do have today. It's our ability to acquire future customers. It's the 20 years of experience that we have solving the problems that matter. The problems that you should be solving with LLMs haven't changed. It's the same problems you should be solving before you had LLMs. And the two decades of experience we have and the knowledge of applying it means that we can solve those problems substantially more quickly. In other words, we've built the infrastructures, the infrastructure you really need for LLMs to be valuable in your enterprise if you want to write profits and not poems with them. And I think one way you can think about this is LLMs in Excel. Like the LLMs are going to make Excel more valuable and useful. They're not going to replace Excel. The LLMs that we've been building with our customers in the field in the last 10 weeks, I've been out there with our customers. We've, we've deployed over 15 co-pilots. The, the time to value here is truly incredible. It's accelerating everything that we've been doing here. So I, I feel really good about the positioning there. And because we've been roughly two decades ahead, it's given us a lot of lead to think about the next ridge line of technical of them. It's really the KLLM kernel. You know, I talked earlier in the remarks about how LLMs are, are, are statistics, not calculus. They're like these stochastic mad scientists. Why on earth would you ask a question of one LLM when you could ask K LLMs? And I think that really honors the fundamental reality that you need a committee here that there isn't an answer to this sort of stochastic question. There are answers, especially when you don't have priors. And you can use this to actually wield these LLMs for decisive operational advantage in the enterprise when you have this sort of framework. So uh, stay tuned, September, AIPCon2, we'll talk more about this. Thanks, Sean. Our next question is from Patrick, who asks, how has the use of AI and LLMs benefited the sales cycle? Are you finding less resistance from internal IT departments? Has it brought more awareness to Palantir products and solutions? Thanks, Patrick. So as I mentioned, we launched AIP just 10 weeks ago. We're already seeing unprecedented interest, both from top of funnel new customers and from existing customers who are looking to expand with the AIP offering. Um, you've heard examples of very real momentum and engagement and impact we're having with it from Jacobs Engineering, JD Powers, Novartis, among others, uh, to name a few. And what we're seeing is with the emergence of LLMs, AI capabilities, operators and organizations are looking at ways to deploy those within their organizations effectively against their missions and do so safely and securely. And we are that solution. We have the product to do that. And we have 20 years of experience deploying our products in the enterprise and being able to do that safely and securely. So while sometimes in the past we may have had misalignment with ID departments, now we're fully aligned with what they're trying to achieve. So in short, we're seeing sales cycles shorten. We're expecting that to continue and accelerate, and we're going to run at that full speed. And um, the, look, we we um, the, especially in the U.S. market, we we were in for lots of reasons misaligned with our clients. We had built products, uh, both foundry uh, and um, the ontology branching, 
and, and lots of ideas of how to manage large scale data sets and then algorithms and classified set, set setting. But in reality, uh, the there was a resistance to how we believed an enterprise should work. And if you look at what Chama is saying and what Ryan is saying, what you're what you're really seeing is American industry now has done five, six iterations, often with thin technologies, with thick sales force sales forces that kind of have been supported by the venture capitalist community, capital community, and quite frankly, by analysts looking for models they understood. We built a company that no one understood. We went deep on technology, that's Foundry. We went deep on the logical extension of that, which is all these precursor technologies that, that we've now begun building into AIP. And that we went deep against the playbook. And in fact, the playbook now does not exist the playbook that is being built looks exactly like the products that are a reflection of our culture. And that's just an insurmountable advantage. And we are very focused on taking advantage of it. Thanks, Ryan and Alex. Our next question is from Emo, who asks, how are you balancing investments for long-term growth while also delivering the profit and performance needed to keep shareholders confident and invested? Because we are. Yeah, we, we are. Uh, thanks, Emo. And, and I think... One, one example of this is we delivered on gap profitability two years before, uh, you know, b before people thought it was coming. Uh, and then if you look to the last three quarters, we had three consecutive quarters of gap profitability. We've now guided uh, to Q3 and Q4 uh, of, of gap profitability. We're here with $3.1 billion uh, on the balance sheet. And we're doing this all while we're investing heavily in AIP. And, and, and we're really doing that across the company, both with money, both with resources, and we're very focused on it. Well, I mean, we delivered profitability years ahead of time. Why do we care about profitability? We care about profitability because we power some of the most important enterprises in the world. They care that we're on st steady footing. We care about it because it shows people that we are serious. We care about it because it positions us to be uh, on indexes like the S&P that show that we are one of the leading industries in the world. We believe in ourselves, which is why we've authorized a buyback to align with this belief in ourself, our belief in profitability aligns with our uh, desire to be on the S&P. We are going to invest in ourselves at, at not at a small scale in the billion dollar to billion dollar range. Um, and so profitability, stability, move to S&P, move to um, a, a company that is reflects what we will be, which we believe is the most important enterprise software company in the world. And these are all very much linked. Thank you both. Our next question is from Jesse who asks, I know you guys are pushing for 5% of defense spending to go to software. How has this been received by policymakers in the defense community? Um, I, we spend a lot of time talking to various parts of the U.S. and allied defense communities. And there's, quite frankly, a varied, very varied views on this. Our view is software it, 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 that's actually used for important purposes, both commercial and non-commercial, has certain attributes. Most likely built in America, it's most like it is built in the product of a, uh, the context of a product, and it's been sold commercially. It is imperative for our country to move to a rebuttable presumption that the institutions that defend us buy a certain portion of software that is a product, more likely than not built in America, and that somebody has actually bought it besides some large program. And it's surprising how many people agree with this. Uh, we're a long way off from getting this done. But as our adversaries become more aggressive, as people come to terms with the fact that many of the things they may have learned in college that we're going to all regress to a state of loving one another are not coming to, to pass. And in fact, our adversaries view that as a laugh laughable fairy tale that we believe in at our own expense. People are getting more serious. When people get more serious, they stop wanting fantasies about how you build software, fantasies about how you implement it, fantasies about you're going to hire 10,000 people and give it to somebody that a company that's never built a product that's ever worked. And they, and, but is that happening fast enough? No. Uh, luckily for us and hopefully uh, for our country and the West, people are getting much more serious just because of, because of uh, events that you see happening around us. If you have any additions. Oh, well said. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Our next question is from Josmar who asks, what's the latest on potential S&P 500 inclusion? The latest is, uh, we expect to be eligible after you report Q3. And so we're proud to say uh, we're less than, than a quarter away. From eligibility. From eligibility. 
Thanks, Dave. Our next question is from Sony, who asks, can you elaborate on current capital allocation priorities? Absolutely. So, um, Sony, we've delivered three consecutive quarters of gap profitability, looking at the first half of the year, $285 million in adjusted free cash flow, uh, close to, you know, almost a billion dollars uh, since we, we've, we've gone public. Um, AIP is going to be transformative. You've talked, you've heard Alex talk about the scale that we think it would be. We've talked about reorienting the company around it. Earlier, I spoke about how we're reorienting our compensation about it. Um, you combine that gap profitability, strong cash flow, AIP. The board just authorized a billion dollar stock buyback, uh, with, which aligns with our goal of S and P five hundred inclusion. We, we, we are very focused on investing in ourselves. It, it is we we are not as focused on acquiring other companies. We believe we have the right products, and or we will build them. So we are investing in what we do, what we believe are the best in the world. Uh, very little interest in, 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 in products we see on the market. And so it's, it's really an investment in ourselves, in our talent through changing the compensation and our ability to retain people by making sure we're focused on a mission that is crazy important to us in the world and showing our beliefs, our belief with actual real attendees uh, and uh, running like hell. Thank you both. Our next question is from Dan with Wedbush. Dan, please turn on your camera, and then you'll receive a prompt to unmute your line. Dan Ives, ladies and gentlemen. Dan Ives. Hello? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, it was a great call uh, and, and just a phenomenal insight that you've provided. I guess my question would be, when it comes to AIP, what surprised you? You know, Alex and, and the team, in other words, the last 10 weeks, has it surprised you just what we've seen from customers, just how dramatic uh, the sort of surge of interest has been? Um, Sean should also talk about this, but what has very much surprised me is the way in which American institutions have metabolized the lessons of the last software wave. So they have a much deeper understanding of what the problem would be that you would solve. And the operators, so the people actually running the business in America realize the determinant variable for changing their margins, changing their profit, and outmaneuvering their competition is AI. And so then, then you have the dynamic with the board. The board is insisting on governance. The operators are insisting on adoption. And this is very, very different than anything I've ever seen. Typically, with software and event intervention, intervention from the outside, you've got to convince the CIO, the board doesn't care, and the operator is focused on business metrics. Here, the operators are saying, I know, um, for example, I was dealing with a large, I was talking to one of the largest transporters of people in the world, and the operator is saying, okay, I know we have a problem with churn. I know we have a problem with logistics. These problems can only be solved algorithmatically, but I can't solve them unless I have a governance structure that allows me to solve them because my board will go nuts. That is basically a shape of a problem only we can solve. And this, this is happening all over America, various problems like this. I'll give you another example. Um, one of the advantages of AI is that if you wanna do manufacturing, say you wanna do Japanese manufacturing in America, you're actually having to use Japanese methodologies with American workers. Heretofore has not been possible. AI can actually allow you to manage the internal dynamics of your workforce so that you get the Japanese culture with American workers in the U.S. And this is this is just absolutely game changing for our country. And why, why is it that now there are other countries, but Europe here is is really going to struggle. But other countries, why is this game changing, particularly for America? Because it allows us to do manufacturing at a level we typically could not do in use cases that we were not good at. It allows us to change the margins. It allows us to do it safely. It'll, it it realigns the institution. So now the IT person, the operator, and the CEO 
are very focused on a use case that will change the sh I can't have your kicks for IT. So this is a completely different moment. Um, and then I'll say something else. Typically, this moment would be captured by non-incumbents, people, early stage and early stage companies. But the, the market is moving too quickly. The barriers to get inside these companies are still there. And then the other incumbents, some of them are very interesting, but most of them just don't build products. They, they don't not, they are, they're companies with thin, beautiful companies. They do things we can't do, but they don't really have many engineers. The engineers have been there for 50 years. They have huge sales forces. They cannot build something that's relevant. And if they could, it's going to take years and there's nothing to acquire. We're not for sale. And on the ground working with customers, I would just add that the ambition has gone way up. People expect the software to work. They, so they're, they're, what do I expect of the software I'm getting from my IT organization has gone up? Then, then the ambition of their own use cases. What do I want to accomplish with the software has gone way up? So that's created a lot of white space to go after. And then when you can deliver 15 co-pilots in nine weeks, it's, you, know, you just get so much more pull on that. The other part that's been rewarding is like we no longer spend time talking about why do you need an ontology we don't even have to use that word anymore because it's it's intuitive it's an it's obvious the infrastructure we've built and how that enables you to actually accomplish these ambitious use cases so it's just been a huge tailwind for us thanks alex and sham our next question is from mariana with bank of america mariana please turn on your camera and then you'll receive a prompt to unmute your line let's turn on everyone very nice to see So my you. question is going to be about AIP. You mentioned more than 100 organizations using it right now. How are you thinking about ratio and timing of conversion? And second, on the other conversations you are having with like what, like 300 plus organizations, how many of those are willing to use it on a foundry platform versus their own? You want to take this? Sure. So the, on By the, the way, it's a pleasure to see you. Finally, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in the phase right now where we're very focused on driving compounding usage of this. It's like, you know, we've, we've done this with Gotham. We've done this with Gaia, with Foundry, with Apollo. And um, what we're excited to see is that we have over 5,000 monthly users. The users are growing 50% uh, month over month. Obviously, we've been doing this for 10 weeks now. That's, that's quite a bit in the enterprise for the pace that we're going at here. I think, you know, let's, let's look and see what happens in the next few months here. But we don't think it's going to be too long to kind of turn that corner. Uh, what was, what, can you remind me the second part of your question? It, it, wait, people who don't have Foundry, how does that oh. work? Oh, I think the, the real focus on the AIP product strategy is to make sure that you can use AIP without Gotham, Foundry, or Apollo. And that to the extent you see the value in these things, you're going to pull them along with you. Now, I think that's where ontology has been most useful in both contexts. Of, you know, we've deployed operational workflows on classified networks using this technology in real world exercises. That's only accomplishable because they're standing on a decade of this well ontologi ontologized data and the kind of enterprise tools that they have for war fighting to accomplish those use cases. So when you look at the time to value, it helps them solve for their use case. The other part though I would point out is people then see the value of bringing their own tools to bear. When I think about the work we're doing with pharma companies and many of the AI models that they've already built, this actually helps them close that last mile where they feel like, look, we have these exquisite models, we have these libraries. How do we actually connect it to the business case of driving drug development more quickly? And then you see these sort of hybrid architectures emerging where you have AIP, you have Foundry, you have their homegrown systems working quite harmoniously against the ambitious problem. Uh, and, and so I think that's been pretty productive. And I think the good part about this, because it's so generative right now, is, is that there is no reference architecture. You're not, you're not getting caught up in kind of academic questions of how should we design this thing. People are forging that and figuring that out relative to what works and delivers value. Let me just riff on that a little bit. We, we built this original project, a product, our first product got us off the ground, made us famous in, in, in a very small market called clandestine services. And uh, that project, product PG, did something really interesting. It, it de facto taught the world what the use case is that you would need to solve and then provided the product that solved it. And that's exactly what we're doing with AIP. It's like you do have an advantage if you already have Foundry because we've already kind of pre-taught you where the road is going to go. But right now, to Sham's point and point I made earlier, there's, there is no roadmap. The product is actually teaching people what the roadmap would look like. That doesn't mean everyone will buy AIP, by the way. So a lot of people say, okay, well, I need these 15 things. I need what Sham is calling an ontology, it's the ability to interact with the LM. I need an ability to take that out and, and, and turn it into logic. 
I need an ability to run that on my enterprise safely. I need all these things. And I want to spend some, some people can say, hey, I want to spend $500 million building that because I want to own it. A lot of those people will fail. Some will succeed. A uh, lots of the other people will buy it from Palantir. But we are de facto teaching people the, the quote unquote roadmap of the way the world will look and the problems you will have to solve. And it teaches them because you can show it live in action. And that's what's going on in the market. And that gets to when will we actually monetize this? We will monetize. Palantir is guilty of many things. People think they thought we were insane. Some people think I'm eclectic. Some analysts think that I am talking something they've never heard of, but, you know, often right. Um, we have no problem monetizing. We make $2.9 million per commercial customer across the world. We will figure out how to monetize it. First, we're teaching the market what it is. We're getting people on board. We're showing people that these are the kind of problems you'll have to solve if you want to uh, engage in actually making money as opposed to writing neat poetry that that may be scary to your enterprise and your board won't let you install anyway. Um, and then we will allow people, then we will charge for that. Thank you both. Alex, as always, we have a lot of investors on the line. Are, are there any other thoughts you'd like to share before we end the call? Um, well, as usual, I'd like to thank our, you know, many of our, our supporters, our clients who've seen this transport transformation and supported it, who are adopting AIP. Um, uh, the Palantirian team, which goes through the vicissitudes of, of our, our shifts and now is fully aligned on uh, building AIP. Um, our retail investors, who I think have been way ahead of everyone else in understanding the product, actually testing it, looking at it, calling customers, um, uh, and in general, uh, the spirit of American innovation from which we are profiting. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Alex. That concludes Q&A for today's call. Attack. Attack. Okay. So, woo. <laughs> okay, that was a funny comment. A lot to cover today. What a call. Oh my goodness. Carp is in this element. Jesus Christ. Dude was on fire. What are you guys thinking about the call? Um, what do you guys think about what the call? What I mean, I'm blown away. I think it was Carp's best call yet. Yeah, he was making fun of analysts. He was in this freaking element. Woo. Probably the best call of Palantir to date. So much to talk about. Oh, my God. I don't know where to start. Uh, where would we start with this? Yeah, I agree with Rich. Terrific call. Wonderful call. Uh, absolutely insane. Uh, wow. I don't know where to start. Jesus Christ, what a great call. Uh, we haven't seen Palantir deliver like that. I mean, visually, as far as, you know, getting on a call, being coherent. Um, wow, that was impressive. That was really impressive. So let's cover everything that we just, wow. Yeah, I agree with Dom. Uh, by the way, shout out to Dom. Go subscribe to his channel right now. You owe it to yourself. Uh, they have confidence shown in that call that uh, they're playing chess and everybody else trying to learn checkers. I 100% agree. There's so much to cover. Okay, so let's start. Number one, I want to first of all talk about the share price. Uh, and by the way, um, this, this would not be accepted in this chat ever, James. <laughs> I'm just kidding, buddy. Everybody's welcome here, even Buckeye fans. Um, okay, so this is something I want to talk about. Could hit 25 tomorrow. Could hit 22 tomorrow. Could hit 35 tomorrow. Could hit 15 tomorrow. Guys, you're missing the point. You're missing the point of this. This is not, you're missing the whole point. You're talking about picking pennies from the train tracks. 25, 20, 22. We're talking about, Jesus, have you not listened to this call? Why would you care if it goes to 25 tomorrow? Would you sell if it goes to 25 tomorrow? If you are, you're missing the whole point of this. Carp was out there explaining to you, mother lovers, why this thing is going to go and become a $1 trillion company. He literally told you we're two decades ahead of the competition. We have 
unprecedented interest in like this so much oh my god why would you care that's such a short-sighted way of looking at things fuck 25 fuck 35 this is like this is like you're missing the big picture here guys just just chill the fuck down uh, again if you're a creator if you're a short-term trader not for you this channel isn't for you it's long-term investors who cares about 25 if anything you should be hoping for a dip so you can dca a little bit more come on guys uh, chill chill with this share price freaking absolute insanity we're talking about a trillion dollar company the most important software company in the world you guys are talking about 25 or 22 or, or tomorrow price who cares who cares like this is insane what you heard in this call is absolutely fucking mind-blowing who cares just forget about the share price Let's talk about the business. This is literally it. This is this is like the the pivot. This is the they've just crossed the Rubicon, guys. Uh, the history buffs will get that reference. This is insane. Look, look. This is what this dude is saying. Listen to him. Don't listen to me. Let's. Okay. Okay. I'll explain. I'll explain something, guys. Check this out. Check this out. I you have to understand what just happened on the call. You remember when Alex Karp said that for the my head is literally exploding. I don't know where to start. There's so much to cover. Oh my god! You remember in the call where he said that this is the first time they've been aligned with IT departments. Let me explain what this means. Let me for the Palantir nerds, you understand exactly what I mean. You remember about a year and a half ago when we had this conversation with Carp, he was on the on the call and he was talking etc cetera, etc cetera. and on this call about a year ago he said our biggest competitors are our own clients they won't let us through the door because they think they can build it better because the it department doesn't want us to come in through the door and show a better product after they've had the ceo spend millions on building their own shit. so basically they're cock blocking us from entering their organizations. The, the point of entry at every organization is the IT department. So the point of contact keeps blocking Palantir. That was their biggest challenge. They've set up a whole sales force to deal with this nonsense because essentially the politics of this was killing their ability to expand. And in a sense, they were always working against the IT department to get in through the front door and, and show management what they can do. What CARP said today was 180 degrees opposite from this. This is something we've never heard from them. Carp said, look, guys, it's not an accident. We have 5,000 users over 10 weeks of AIP. This isn't an accident. This is the first time in their history that we, we, the IT department are calling us. They're asking us to come. We're no longer fighting these guys to get a chance to present to the management. They're calling us to come because they need us, which is exactly what I told you is going to happen a year ago. When this shit was happening a year ago, I told you at some point, I don't know when, but at some point, it's going to be so detrimental for you not to have Palantir you're going to be calling for them to come bail you out because you don't have it and your all your competitors already have it. This is literally what's going on right now. It's a race to who can get Palantir faster and better. So that, fuck the 25. I don't care about that. Think about what he just said. It's massive. Think about the fact that he said that Palantir is literally two decades ahead of the competition. Think about the implications of what it means. I mean, if if do you think a CEO would come out and say, hey, listen, we're two decades ahead of our competition without backing it up, especially a company that's been delivering for 20 years? I mean, think about it. 20, 20 years ahead of the comp. What does this mean? We, it means we're the best in the business. We're not for sale. What this means? We're the best in the business. He literally told you twice, we are the best in the business by a country mile, by saying we're not for sale. We're ahead of the competition by 20 years. I mean, this is insane stuff. I mean, $25, really? This is what you think this company is worth? Who cares? I couldn't care less about that. Look, you guys have been praying for this. Look, you have a CEO here of a company, a CEO of a company who actually cares about retail investors. Name me one CEO of a major public company of 20 and above billion dollars market cap who thanks retail investors in their call saying that the retail investors knew before the analysts, before the institutional investors that Palantir was the shit. Show me one CEO with the exception of Elon Musk, maybe. Who else ever talked to you guys like this? Who, show me a CEO that talks to retail investors in their call and talks to them respectfully in, in the same level, not condescending, just saying, hey, you guys got us before everybody else. Are, are you guys going to see how insane that is? And Carp was in this element today. He was killing it through the entire earnings call. He was relaxed. He was calm. He was making fun of analysts. 
for clowning him. Think about 5,000 users in 10 weeks of AIP. Absolutely insane. That's the best call Palantir has ever had. We've never, like, even Dan Ives, shout out to Dan Ives, in his question, he was basically making fun of analysts. Dan Ives, on his, on his question, he's like, were you surprised by AIP success? He's basically making fun of all these other idiots. Dan Ives will be will be written in history forever as the first major analyst to identify what Palantir is. They're all going to follow his footsteps and they're all going to copycat Dan Ives, but now forever because of what he's done, he's now forever ingrained in history, basically saying, I, I was the first. He's like Tom Nash. You know how Tom Nash is the first YouTube finance guy to talk about Palantir? That's forever mine. Nobody can ever take this away from me. Dan Ives has his moment right now. He's the first analyst before all these other bozos to actually identify this. That's why I named my video the best Palantir analyst of all time. That's not an accident. Now he's going to be that forever. Carp just told you, hey, we're going to be the best software company in the world. We're not no longer fighting with IT departments. We're seeing unprecedented interest in AIP. We're two decades ahead of the competition. We're going to have a $1 billion buyback just so that Wall Street can relax. We're, we're, we're going to have the S&P inclusion probably in the quarter you know, just to get Wall Street relaxed. I mean... We're gonna link. Look, we're not even. We're not. Look how much stuff they had in this call. We haven't even said a word. A word about the fact that they're linking stock-based comp to the success of AIP. So the entire compensation structure of all employees will now fully be linked to the success of AIP. Nobody's gonna get anything without the success of the platform that they're building. Absolutely insane. And by the way, I want to give a few shoutouts. There was a few super chats I missed. Sorry. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the super chats right now. So first of all, David Gara, David Gora, sorry, thank you for the five dollar donation. I really appreciate it. Been holding since I bought at twenty five dollars and it dropped to five. Keep holding. Exactly. Long term investors don't sell a good thing when it becomes cheaper. They buy more of it. That's a very very simple thing. Like if something is really good and it's selling at the cheaper price, would you sell that? That's just flawed logic to me. Shout out to Luminator. For a $69, $20 Canadian donation. Luluminator is one of my moderators. He's an OG in the channel. He's here in every freaking, every freaking stream. Uh, and somebody asked here in the chat earlier, why would anybody not compete with them? Why would they not be bought up? So number one, you cannot buy out Palantir uh, for the one reason that they have class F shares. It's impossible. Like Alex and Peter Thiel, they have a veto forever. Nobody's going to buy that. And also, they have so much government business that depends on them being exclusive for the West and not work with China and all the enemies of the U.S. So that's not going to work with Microsoft, any of the other players. So they're not for sale. They cannot be bought. And mostly, like, look, even beyond the point that they're not for sale, think about it. Um, it just it doesn't make sense. Why would they? They already have the industry by the balls. Why would Microsoft or Google not develop anything? Like this? Well, it took Palantir 20 years and tens and hundreds of billions of dollars of governmental budgets to build this thing. You think they're going to just catch up to them in a year? It's very like, it's very like, uh, Microsoft is Palantir killer. We'll see, come on, we'll see. So far, we haven't seen anything of that sort. We've seen every big boy just collaborate with them. We haven't seen nobody kill them. We've seen everybody do deals with them. We've seen Amazon do deals with them. We saw IBM do deals. So we've seen all the big boys just collab with them. We haven't seen anybody kill them so far, but we'll see. Um, we'll see. Um, yeah, Dom is right. Elon is the only one that is exactly that ever even mentioned retail investors. Most of these CEOs, they don't give a shit about retail investors. They'll shit on them. They ignore them. They think we're trash. They're talking about because look at the market. 80% of the market is institutional money. So when you see a movement in the market, 80 cents on the dollar, it's institutional money. 20 cents on the dollar, it's retail money. It's just, it's always been like that. So when the CEO talks about investors, they care about that 80%. They don't give a fuck about the 20% retail investors. The only ones who care, like there's no reason to talk about retail investors. They don't move the market. Institutional investors move the market, like really long term. So the only reason for a CEO to even mention retail investors is because he cares. He gives a fuck. That's the only reason. There's nothing to be gained from that. And so the fact of the matter is he's mentioning it in every single call and he's taking retail investors means that he gives a fuck. And that to me is like, it's, it's a big deal. Um, Hey, look, uh, it's a valid question, Diego. I don't trade this stock. For me, it's a long-term investor. I, I, I invest in this company long-term. I don't do options on Palantir. I don't trade Palantir. It's not my thing. I buy and I buy more and then I buy more. That's the only strategy I employ. Uh, 
And again, we haven't even said a word about the fact that Palantir is probably the best artificial intelligence play in the entire market, better than NVIDIA, probably comparable to Tesla. Um, I mean, Tesla is catching up because they have a lot of data, but I mean, Palantir has been doing AI development for the past 20 years. Palantir was the first one to even mention, like whenever, the first time I heard machine learning came from Palantir. I've not heard the term machine learning before Palantir brought it up. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. There's so much to cover. I don't know where we're going to start. Um, Dom is saying, Carp literally told everyone uh, we are putting our money where our mouth is, make bank doing this $1 billion buyback later, and the SBC uh, aligning with the product success is perfection. Exactly. So look, if you're an employee and now your stock-based compensation is completely linked to the performance of AIP, what's going to happen? You're going to be more invested in the process, more invested in the results. And then they want results from employees. That's a beautiful strategy. Um, look, uh, Mads, that's actually a good question. Uh, rather R&D than buyback. What is he referring? Wouldn't this money be better used for research and development instead of a buyback of shares? Yes, in essence. But look, Mads, they're sitting on, on $3 billion of cash. So they have plenty of money to do research and development. They're not in shortage of cash. They're cash flow positive. They're not losing money, and they're sitting on a pile of $3 billion of cash. They can afford to do a little bit of signaling to help Wall Street institutional investors to jump in. I totally understand where they're coming from. Uh, what else we have here, guys? Let's see. Um, yeah, I agree with that. It was a freaking phenomenal call. Um, Microsoft would never buy Palantir. I don't think they can because of the Class F shares and because the exposure to the government business. The government doesn't want, uh, it, it cannot, these contracts with the government cannot survive Microsoft ownership because of all the exposure to China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think it's going to happen. Um, uh, this is another important thing that he said in the call and I kind of missed. And thank you, Don, for bringing this up. Uh, and I'm going to read the comment because I think it's a, it's a, it's a phenomenal comment. Um, so he's basically saying, uh, we're building products that companies won't know they need for another five years. It's literally what um, what Zero to One was. When Peter Thiel wrote Zero to One back in the day, he said, hey, I'm going to build a company that's going to be going to monopolize a market that doesn't even exist yet. It's literally what Carp is saying for the next five years. Palantir is always playing ahead of the game. And, you know, Wall Street has enough time to catch up with that. And sometimes they misprice the company. No problem. I'll pick it up for cheap. No, I'm not complaining. Uh Tom, um, out of 10, how much trouble are you going to be with the family? 10. 10. <laughs> I'm going to pay for this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pay for this. Um, again, Jay, that's very short-sighted. I don't care about the fair price after this earning. I care about the fair price in five years. I care about the fair price in 10 years. For me, it's a good company to own. I buy more when it's down. I buy less when it's up. My threshold is $18. Anything above $18, I buy slowly anything below 18 dollars i buy faster if there's a new high for the stock this line is going to change very very simple we talk about it every single day uh, i'm not going to say where because i'm not going to plug my shit in the stream this stream is plug free not talking about my promotional stuff not talking about anything just here to give you information so there's going to be zero promotion of any sorts on this on the stream whatsoever i've decided this before i started that there's going to be no promotion uh, shout out to shubi you do shub Shubidu, sorry, Shubidu. Uh, uh, Palantir and C3A and Salonis are on similar levels. We're debating between Salonis and Palantir in my business. Let's chat in Discord sometime. Definitely. So sign up, you know, just go to Discord. It's free to join my Discord. Just join the Discord and, you know, send me a DM. Happy to chat for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, no, I don't think they have, Michael. I think their earnings were very, very solid in every single parameter you can think about. The stock is up 3% in aftermarket for a reason. There's a reason the stock is up 3%. It's a very unforgiving market right now. Everybody who screwed up in this market paid dearly in aftermarket and the next day, you would agree with me. Nobody delivered bad results in this in this environment and got away with it. So the fact of the matter is Palantir is up 3% means it had good earnings. It wasn't mind-blowingly, orgasmically, you know, you know, monkey sex in the chandelier kind of thing, right? But I mean, it was a it was good earnings, good results, good trajectory. They keep on grind, grinding forward, but they delivered so much fucking mind blowing stuff about the future of Palantir, which is what I care about. That I thought it's the best call to date. It's the most convenient, relaxed, absolutely in their element. I saw them definitely. Carp, Carp was killing it today. Absolutely beautiful. Um, okay, what else we have? Um, 
I would love to hear about it. Okay, so that's that's the conversation we need to have, Dom. That's actually very interesting. Uh, yeah, Sham also was very good today. Very good today. Amazing call. I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. So shout out to the 2,000 people who lasted for two hours on this call, unannounced, unscheduled, unpromoted. You guys just showed up the minute I went live. Thank you so much. It's been a blast. I'm going to end this broadcast right here. Go to bed. It's the middle of the night right here. It's... Uh, 10 minutes past midnight so i think it's uh, late enough for me uh, to sign off today thank you everybody for joining me today i really appreciate it um okay so quick answer for this okay this is an important question before i sign off hold on a second hold on hold on can you explain why they're doing buybacks and why people are freaking out about it there's nothing to freak out about buybacks is when the company buys back its shares it sends a signal to institutional shareholders that the company thinks that their share shares are not expensive that they're cheap the only reason for a company to buy back its shares is if the company thinks that the shares are cheap. So if the company is basically signaling to institutional shareholders, the Black Rocks, the Vanguards, to start buying the shares because they're saying, hey, we're buying it because it's cheap. So we're putting our money where my mouth is, et cetera, et cetera. So the counter argument to this would be, well, look, uh, this money should have been better utilized instead of buying back shares to actually invest in things that grow the company, like research and development, like capital expenditures, et cetera, et cetera. Put the money back in the company. Don't buy shares, et cetera, et cetera. It's a counter argument. But with Palantir, with positive cash flow, with $3 billion in the bank, I think they got plenty of cash It's okay to say. Thank you so much. I love you all. I'll see you in the next stream. Killer stream today. Thank you, guys.